So my name is Jeremy Travis. I'm the president of John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Uh, and on behalf of our uh, faculty and students and staff here, and on this occasion on behalf of the, uh, the panel on the causes and consequences of high rates of incarceration, uh, I want to welcome all of you to this uh, day's discussion on uh, incarceration and uh, the implications of the National Academy panel for New York State. Uh, what I'd like to do first, just to give you a sense of the, of the day ahead, is to uh, ask you to just work with me to understand the logic of the program so that you'll see where we're doing, how we're building. We have crammed in a lot of stuff today, a lot of people uh, to speak, and I just want you to just spend some time with me uh, looking at the program so that you'll see where we're headed. You are now having breakfast, so that's the easy part. <laughs> We're going to then switch gears to a, um, a fairly formal presentation of the findings of the National Academy panel. I'm going to be doing that alone. Uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Bruce Western, uh, who's the vice chair of the panel, uh, has a family uh, emergency that's keeping him in Boston. So uh, I miss him already. Uh, we were, we were uh, comrades in arms on this project, and uh, he can't be with us. Uh, and for his part of the presentation, I'm going to try to mimic his Australian accent. So, um, uh, but uh, we were gonna split this, but I'll do the whole thing. So that's uh, a half hour uh, of pretty intense, um, pretty packed uh, overview of the re committee report. We then are gonna switch gears to um, hear from some members of the panel of the National Academy of Sciences who have generously agreed to be here. These are, uh, are my, also my comrades in arms. We spent, uh, um, the better part of uh, over two and a half years together, uh, twice a year uh, for two or three days at a time, uh, working on the uh, Academy report, and I'll sort of explain the process in my remarks. Uh, but we, we're very fortunate that we have Larry Mead from uh, NYU, uh, Khalil Gibran Mohammed, haven't seen him yet, but he'll be here, from the Schomburg Center, uh, Dr. Uh, Jody Rich from, uh, from Brown University, and Heather Ann Thompson from Temple. So those members of the panel, and I'll be uh, part of that discussion as well, uh, will be uh, going over some of the findings in, in greater depth, uh, and that is gonna be facilitated. We're very fortunate that uh, Nick Turner, uh, president of the Vera Institute of Justice, has agreed to facilitate that part of our conversation. Please note that at 10.30, uh, Nick will open up the uh, um, process for questions from the audience. So, just keep track of your questions. Uh, it's a short period of time for Q&A. You can always ask uh, during the coffee breaks, but if you have questions, uh, Nick will, uh, will recognize you during that time, and please keep questions uh, concise uh, and direct them to the panel. Then we take a coffee break, and we hope that there'll be a lot of mingling happening during that time, because uh, we want to also create a community here of people interested in these topics. And then we switch ge gears one more time uh, and ask the implications of all of this work for, uh, for our state, for New York State. So the, the logic here is re research findings, panel discussion, what does this mean for us here in New York? And we're again very fortunate uh, that uh, our, my colleague and very good friend at CUNY, uh, the Dean of CUNY Law School, Michelle Anderson, is going to facilitate that discussion. A, another packed panel, uh, and you'll see that some people are identified there as being their title and members of the Permanent Sentencing Commission in New York State. Uh, so we're gonna be asking them in a public setting to talk about their work, and they'll say what they would like to say to us. Uh, and those are Cyrus Vance and Juanita Big Newton, uh, uh, the Dean of the New, New York uh, Judicial Institute, uh, and uh, Professor Sean Bushway from uh, University of Albany. Uh, and some elected officials. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Senator Ruth Hassel-Thompson has just indicated late last night that she has a late breaking conflict, so she can't be here. But we're very lucky uh, that uh, Assemblyman Daniel O'Donnell and Assemblyman Jeff Aubrey uh, will, will be here. So we have two of our elected officials talking about what our legislature is going to do on sensing reform, what, how they think about all this stuff, and two uh, sort of outside experts who are thinking about these issues from different perspectives. Uh, Rosanna Rosado, who's the chair of the newly created um, uh, Reentry Council, created by our governor, uh, and now a distinguished lecturer here, here at John Jay. Um, and Glenn Martin, who is the Executive Director of Just Leadership USA. So those different perspectives will be um, 
Michelle will figure out a way to keep all of them uh, coherent <laughs> or talking to each other in some way. Again, note at 12.15, there'll be time here that we've set aside for Q&A because we want to have that sort of interactive opportunity. Uh, and then as, your, as a reward for having listened carefully and asked really great questions, you get lunch. So lunch happens, again, mingling time. We want to create, rather than just dismiss everybody, we want to create uh, opportunity for people to, to talk uh, to each other. And then we uh, will have a keynote address at 1 o'clock. Uh, again, I feel really uh, very fortunate that we have as our speaker today uh, Lenore Anderson, and if you have tracked at all what's happening in California, uh, politically, legislatively, message-wise, uh, the work that Lenore is doing uh, in California is really, I think, groundbreaking. Uh, so we want to end the day with challenging all of us to think outside of New York, outside of research, and to think about how do you, how do you think practically and, in a sense, politically about sentencing reform, which is what the key message from the National Academy report is that this is about policy choice and policy change. So I want to be the first to acknowledge that Lenore Anderson is, yes, the sister of Michelle Anderson. So in case you look at their family resemblance and you listen to their voices and you say, could it be? I want to tell you it is true. So we have stars uh, in, uh, coming out of that one family. And then the final closing remarks will be the chair of the John Jay Board, Jules Kroll, who on behalf of the board and on behalf of the business community of New York wants to uh, pledge his commitment, the board's commitment, uh, to this work over the next 10 years. That's what we're doing. You got the arc of the day? So that's where we want to, uh, what we want, the ground that we want to cover. So uh, notice that you don't have a time for Q&A right now, so we're just going to jump right in. So, uh, so now I want to speak to you in a slightly different uh, voice, uh, content-wise and, and um, role-wise. Uh, and I'm speaking to you now as the chair of the uh, panel that was convened by the National Academy of Sciences to examine the causes and consequences of high rates of incarceration in the United States. So uh, this was a great privilege for me to serve as chair of the panel. Uh, you'll see when you meet the fellow panelists that I was very fortunate to uh, be joined on that by, there were 20 of us all together, but uh, uh, 19 additional uh, scholars and experts in this field. Uh, and all of us worked uh, amazingly hard and with great dedication uh, to, the, to the cause, basically, because we wanted to take advantage of what we saw uh, as a rare opportunity. So in the first slide, now you'll follow along here with me, uh, we want to just talk about what it means for, the, uh, for those who don't know, for the National Academy to have convened a panel. So the National Academy is... Uh, was chartered by the Congress of the United States in 1863. That was a while ago uh, by President Lincoln. He served as president a while ago. So this is a longstanding national treasure, the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, it's the independent source of research-based advice to government and to the larger American uh, society and public. Within that is the Committee on Law and Justice, which I chair, a uh, standing committee to provide expert advice on criminal justice issues. Um, and in early 2012, the National Institute of Justice and the uh, MacArthur Foundation, uh, next slide, uh, provided funding for this idea. So there was a subcommittee created of myself and Glenn Lowry, Tracy Mears, and Phil Cook designed this project. We brought it to the National Academy. They blessed it. Uh, the next step was to raise money, uh, which we did. We were very grateful. Without that support, this would not have happened. So we always thank uh, our funders. So what was our mission? What was our charge? So let me just be very precise about this. Um, our, let me make sure I got the next one. So th no, just go back to the, to the panel members. You'll see this in your book also, but this, these are the folks that I was privileged to work with and uh, the committee I was privileged to chair, uh, really remarkable national experts uh, who have approached, just look at the variety of disciplines there. We had historians, the economists, uh, judges, uh, people who did pol political work, criminologists, uh, legal theorists. Um, so part of the challenge and sometimes uh, the, the difficulty of working this through is we had so many different academic disciplines looking at uh, the questions I'm about to read to you. So in the next slide, you'll see the uh, charge to the committee. So let me summarize it this way. So we were charged with answering four questions. What changes in the United States society and public policy drove the rise in incarceration? 
So we're starting with this fact, which we revisit in the findings, uh, that we've had the significant increase in incarceration rates. And we're asking, what were the causes of that increase? Didn't come from nowhere. What were the causes of it? Uh, secondly, what have been the consequences for, of these changes for crime rates in particular, uh, but also for other types of consequences that are not always considered, such as for those in confinement, uh, for their families and their children, neighborhoods and communities, the economy, politics, structure, and culture of our society. So a, an enormous charge given to us uh, by the National Academy that we proposed, and they said that's what we want you to do. And then finally, as is true with all National Academy panels, we were asked to consider what are the implications of our review of the evidence uh, for uh, uh, policy on the, on the causes and effects of high rates of incarceration. So the process that we went through was to, uh, it's, a, it's a closed session, we can't talk about what we talked about, uh, but we produced a report uh, that was produced both by staff and by members of the panel, sort of interactively. That report that was then subjected to the most rigorous peer review process any of us has, has ever endured uh, by an anonymous external panel, a shadow panel created to mirror all of the expertise on our panel, a shadow panel, that was, was asked to test every one of our findings. Uh, we didn't know who they were until the book was published, uh, and you'll see uh, that they were also uh, people of high prestige. And then that review process resulted in a National Academy internal process to determine whether our report was ready for publication. So that's what happened. Uh, just We can talk more about that at a break if you'd like to. Uh, but a, a, the fact that this came out of the National Academy is something you should carry with you as you think about the findings. This is not random uh, opinions of 20 people. This is a review of the evidence under, the, under these processes by the National uh, Academy. The report was released on April 30th uh, with a lot of fanfare in Washington. Uh, Bruce and I presented a panel that included Craig Haney and Greg, uh, Glenn Lowry. Uh, we brief, briefed Congress, we briefed uh, Senate and House, the White House. Uh, we're going back for two more sessions in uh, October and November. Uh, September and October, rather, so uh, it's getting a lot of attention, which we're very grateful for, and in essence, this is the New York relaunch of our book. So, now let me, again, I'm going really quickly here, but I want to go to what are, what are the uh, findings. I'm going to summarize them first, and then we'll start talking, sort of deconstruct them. So what was our bottom line conclusion and recommendations? The panel found that incarceration rates in the United States have more than quadrupled, it's about 450% actually, over the past four decades. A phenomenon without precedent in the history of our country, and the current rates of incarceration place the United States far outside the experience of other Western democracies. There's a sentence that carries a lot of data, but that's a, a summary of that evidence. Second, the increase in incarceration rates was most directly the result of policy choices, not crime rates. Another very important summary of the evidence. Third, the higher incarceration rates may have reduced aggregate crime rates, but the evidence on this question is highly uncertain. That's a scientific conclusion. It's very hard to disentangle these uh, dynamics all at work at the same time. And most studies indicate that the crime reduction effect was small. We use the word small, we use the word modest at different points in the report. We also found that the growth in incarceration may have had significant negative consequences. As, again, there's some scientific uh, cautionary language there for the individuals incarcerated, their families and communities, and the broader US society. And finally, we found that the harsh effects of the effects of harsh penal policies have fallen mostly heavily, most heavily on blacks and Hispanics, especially the poorest, and these effects are concentrated in neighborhoods already experiencing significant social disadvantage. Finally, given the enormous investment of resources with uncertain public safety benefits and likely social costs, the panel therefore recommends that policymakers take steps to significantly reduce, significantly is an important word, the nation's reliance on incarceration, improve prison conditions for those incarcerated, and strengthen the communities that have been most adversely affected 
by the growth in incarceration rates over the past four decades. So that's an official summary of our findings. Now we're going to go through them uh, with a little bit uh, slower pace, uh, step back from those overarching conclusions and try to break it apart. So the first slide, nope, one back. There we go. One back. There we go. You, uh, just missed that dramatic moment. Okay, the first slide underscore, underscores an important historical finding. We've seen this. If you're in this business, you know this. The beginning, uh, the, the U.S. incarceration rate has remained relatively stable for 50 years from 1925 to 1972. Beginning in 1973, however, as the second slide indicates, thank you, Bettina, uh, the um, incarceration has, rate has more than quadrupled. That is a, an important scientific finding. You should take it with you. I am amazed with how many people I, I run into say, oh, it hasn't always been this way? It has not always been this way. In American history, it has never been this way. And for a long time, it was very different. So something happened in the early 1970s when we were asked to uh, disentangle that. So we also looked at incarceration rate, not just in comparison to our history, but in comparison to other countries. Next slide. This shows the incarceration rate of other Western democracies, which is about what it used to be in the US in the 1920s and 1970s, 100, 150, maybe less per 100,000. This is actually jails and prisons. Now we'll do the dramatic moment, add the US rate on the top, next slide, and that's our current incarceration rate. This is how different we are from every other Western democracy in terms of the use of prison, and this is also jails, to, uh, in response to crime. So our first conclusion of the panel was that the growth in incarceration rates in the US over the past 40 years is historically unprecedented and internationally unique. So that conclusion provides a starting point for taking on our first task, which is to try to understand how did, we, how did we get there? Why are we at a place where we've never been before in our country? So here we relied wonderfully on our historians and our political scientists uh, and others who have tracked this uh, as a matter of legal theory over time. So there are three chapters in the book. By the way, you can all buy the book. We get no royalties, but the book is for sale somewhere here, right there. Um, so there are three chapters that look at the, at the, the explanatory uh, variables for what, what caused that increase. And we go back way before the, the 1970s. We go back uh, actually to the beginning of the century. Uh, but we take particular note of these 1960s and 1970s and note that crime rates increased significantly. Murder rates doubled uh, in the 60s, uh, continued to rise through the 1980s. And this was at a same time when you expand your lens, there was a lot of uh, turmoil in our country, a lot of change in our country, civil rights movement, changing social mores, urban riots, political protests, all of which provided the political context for campaigns, political campaigns, promising to restore law and order. A lot of uh, disorder, a lot of disruption, a lot of change, changed the political climate in the country. Changes in the economy of poor neighborhoods, also meant that crime became more concentrated uh, at this uh, period of uh, time in communities of high racial segregation. So the context and the, and the narrative became racialized more than we've ever seen uh, before at this time. So it was this combination of rising crime, social change, urban unrest, which created an environment which within elected leaders uh, and those running for office embraced more punitive criminal justice policies. So the call for more severe responses to crime fell on fertile ground during this time. So judges, parole boards, and over different decades, different things happened, but it was all sort of, of a piece. There's a long narrative here. It's not the same over every decade, but the politics changed, policy changed, and uh, we are seeing the results of that. So for nearly 50 years, from the 20s to the 70s, we should go back to that period in time, Every state and the federal government and the District of Columbia embraced the philosophy of indeterminate sentencing. That philosophy allowed for more flexibility in thinking about uh, who gets out of prison when, who goes to prison why, uh, but that, the politics started to change, sentencing policy started to change. And between 1975 and 1995, all 50 states and the federal government enacted laws reducing judges' discretion by mandating imprisonment for a variety of offenses, mandatory minimums, uh, and uh, Congress and state legislatures enacted laws that mandated lengthy prison sentences, 10, 
20 years longer than was previously imposed for drug offenses, violent offenses, and repeat offenders. So these two things were happening legislatively at the same time in our nation's legislatures, mandatory minimums and making long sentences longer. They, they were given a, these were given a number of names, truth and sentencing was one, three strikes you're out was another, uh, life without parole was another, but the basic common element here is long sentences longer and mandatory minimums for, for areas where judges previously had discretion. So in our panel's assessment of these profound shifts in sentencing policy, what's the next one? Yeah. There we go, yep, thank you. Uh, we reviewed the research to determine how much the increase in incarceration rates, the phenomenon we describe, can be explained by these contributing factors, right? So, and we determined that the growth in state prison populations is almost equally explained by two factors. About half of the increase is attributable to the increased rate of incarceration per arrest. More arrests, so we're getting, it's not that more arrests, but for each arrest we're tougher, right? We sentence people to prison more often. Uh, and the other half is explained by longer sentences being imposed per conviction. So these explanations, just to step back from what I just said, share, share a common feature, which is that they are the result of policy decisions. Mostly legislative, but sometimes executive branch weighs in here through parole policy changes. Sometimes uh, uh, judges as well, but it's, made, it's policy choices that are explaining the, the growth. So our finding that the current state of incarceration is largely the result of policy decisions becomes important later, so hold on to that thought when we discuss the recommendations, the, what flows from that evidence. We only looked at evidence. We didn't say, how do we want the world to be? We say, what are, what are the implications of the evidence? So before discussing the consequences of the high rates of incarceration, I want to point out that our panel did not find that the increase in incarceration rates was caused by the increase in crime rates. Let me say it one more time. Our panel did not find that the increase in incarceration rates was caused by the increase in, in, incar in crime rates in a mechanical sort of way, but our panel did find that the changes in crime rates, particularly in the 60s and 70s, changed the environment within which crime policy was made. So that's an indirect cause of those changes in crime rates but not a direct cause in a mechanical sense of, of crime rates, because crime went up and down, as we know, over this period of time. So, a very important fi finding of what, what we did not find, right? So, in short, our panel concluded that the rising incarceration rates mostly reflected policy choices, not changing crime rates, and that the larger prison population that we documented is almost equally attributable to two trends, more people to prison per arrest, which is basically reducing discretion uh, by mandatory minimums, and those already being sent to prison are being sent to prison longer, right? So a, a, a sort of the, the, the extenders on, on prison sentences, uh, mostly by legislative action, actions. So we're doing a rapid romp through findings, so we're going to switch now to consequences. Next slide, I think. There we go. So what does this mean for our country? What does this mean for communities? What does it mean for families of those incarcerated? What does it mean for those incarcerated uh, in our prisons, having more than quadrupled the rate of incarceration? So if, again, another finding that we're, not, that we're familiar with is that the increase in incarceration is not spread evenly across the country. It's highly concentrated in a small number of communities. So this big ramp up is concentrated in a small number of communities, communities of color, communities of disadvantage, that are now bearing the brunt of these policy choices. So the racial dimensions of this, again, well known to most people in this audience, uh, incarceration rate for African Americans are about four and a half to six and a half times higher than for whites over this period of time. Uh, for Hispanics, about two, three times higher than whites over this period of time. We also focused a lot in our report, I think appropriately, on another area of stratification that is not one that we use in our language every day. So we highlight it, uh, and I'll show you some uh, graphs in a second, some actual data here. Uh, and that's the 
the uh, disaggregation by level of schooling. So it's a way of talking about uh, individuals who are sort of not, not uh, on track, those people who are, who are dropped out of high school. So this, I attribute uh, this to Bruce Western's work. Uh, he's done a lot of groundbreaking work with his colleagues on this. So to illustrate the social and racial concentrations here and the rapid changes over a short, four decades, <laughs> sorry, is a short period of time, let's just focus on this subpopulation of African-American men who have dropped out of high school, okay? So this is the risk of imprisonment for those men, most incarceration is about men, who have dropped out of high school by race. And you'll see that it's about, for those in the bar chart of the far, the bar of the far right, about 15% likelihood that they will have served a year in prison by the time they reach 30 to 34. So we're talking about life chances. What are your life chances if you were born in this cohort, which is basically the baby boomer cohort? If you were born in those years and you're an African-American male, what are the lifetime chances if you drop out of high school, are you with me, that you will have served at least a year in prison? So this is before the buildup, right? So that's uh, about a 15% chance. The next one will show the same data after the buildup. So this is in the span of a generation. The lifetime chances of serving at least a year in prison for an African-American male who has dropped out of high school by the time he's 30 to 34 is now 68%. Rapid, dramatic social change. So we focus on this as a way of illustrating racial dimensions, as a way of illustrating the depths of concentration in poor community and people who are struggling to uh, uh, sort of make it through life. So interestingly, we also found that as prisons expanded, uh, they didn't expand rapidly enough. We had a big increase in uh, double selling, triple selling, use of uh, uh, cafeterias as uh, dormitories and the like. Uh, but we also found uh, that prisons became safer over this period of time, which many explanations, I would give that uh, a tip of the hat to the people who, who are colleagues in the corrections uh, field. A lot of changes in training, a lot of uh, increase in professionalization. But levels of violence went down, even though people had predicted as the prisons became more crowded, just the opposite would happen. We focus a lot in chapters six and seven on the experience of incarceration, particularly isolation um, uh, from a psychological, mental health point of view, and the mental health and health status of those coming into a prison and uh, their time in prison and exiting prison. Uh, if that's your interest, I strongly recommend, these, are, these were big contributions, I think, of our report, uh, looking at the way in which prisons have become a, a part of our public health um, infrastructure. So much of the focus on the effects of incarceration, the incarceration boom, have focused on crime rates. So we were specifically asked by the Academy to look at the impact on uh, crime. And this is where I think this audience in particular has to sort of think about how do, how do, how do you incorporate these findings uh, from the National Academy report into your daily narratives about the, the work that you do. So there have been many studies that have tried to estimate the effect on crime. Note that we're not saying to what extent is the crime decline attributable to increased incarceration. We're going in the other way. To what extent does the increased incarceration uh, reduce crime? So we, we, our panel looked at those studies. Uh, they have uh, different uh, estimates, uh, different conclusions. Uh, we ended up saying that the evidence is very uh, uncertain here. Uh, and this is in, in part a methodological observation that it's hard to disentangle uh, a number of factors going on at the same time over, uh, over a long period of time. Uh, so there's no strong scientific consensus about this uh, question. So we, we, this will be unsatisfying to some. We, we say that it's uncertain. But we do note with interest that all of the efforts that have tried to disentangle this have ended up finding that the impact on crime is very modest. Now, we are, we are on stronger scientific ground, and we make a special point of this in Chapter 5, of reviewing the research literature on the impact of long incarceration rates, long incarceration periods, in other words, people being uh, held in, period, in prison for a long time, on crime, and there there's a, a stronger scientific finding that holding somebody in prison till they get much older has very little effect on public safety. 
So if a lot of what's driving the incarceration rates is longer prison sentences for those already in prison, then no surprise that the finding might be modest. Secondly, we review the literature on mandatory minimums, the long literature here going back to Bartley Fox in the 70s and in Massachusetts, finding that the impact of mandatory minimums on crime rates is also very small, very strong literature here. So the two big drivers both have stronger scientific conclusions for saying that the, their impact on crime is modest. So it's not surprising when, when you try to look at everything that the scientific uh, drift would be towards modest, minimal, no, I wouldn't say negligible, impact on crime. It's not to say there's no impact on crime. We don't say that at all. Uh, but that the aggregate effect, aggregate effect is modest. So putting all this together, we have um, also a charge from the National Academy to look at the impact of incarceration beyond the individual incarcerated, beyond crime rates. So we looked at the um, impact on families, children, uh, and uh, there's a growing literature uh, here that we reviewed uh, that shows that, um, let me get to the children, but, but, uh, incarceration is associated with weaker family bonds, lower levels of child well-being, associated with uh, family economic insecurity and housing instability. Uh, again, we, we always comment when we think the, the uh, what, what the research agenda should be here. Here's an area where there's a lot more research to be done. Uh, we looked at the impact on uh, labor markets and the ability of individuals who have been incarcerated to participate in the workforce. Uh, and we looked at experimental evidence, some of which was done here in New York, um, uh, by, uh, in, in fact, by, by Bruce Western and uh, um, Diva Pager, uh, showing the reluctance of employers to hire people with, with records. Uh, and the negative effects of a criminal record being twice as large for African Americans than for whites. So you put all this together in a review of the evidence and uh, it shows a significant um, uh, levels of difficulty for people to, uh, to participate in the workforce. And then finally we looked, stepped another step back and asked what are the wider consequences of higher incarceration rates for uh, our society. And uh, we uh, again reviewed literature, a lot of it from uh, political science and sociology disciplines, looking at uh, the impact of a large marginalized population on our society, on voting participation, on uh, juror participation, uh, on the way people relate to each other, and interesting literature there showing uh, a, a um, reluctance to participate in civic life uh, if you've uh, been incarcerated and how difficult that is. And we, we make uh, comments here about the, again, reviewing this literature about how this is uh, damaging uh, to our uh, democracy. Uh, and of course, we looked at cost. Uh, the costs here are enormous. States spent 53 billion on incarceration, on corrections in 2012, up from 6.7 billion in only 1985. Uh, federal government spent another six and a half billion. Uh, and then you add in jails and you're starting to make, uh, get to a real number. So uh, the consequence of these chapters the full um, effect of these chapters on the consequences of incarceration is summed up in the word that we use uh, several times throughout the book, the footprint. The footprint of high incarceration rates on our, on our society is, is palpable, it's demonstrable, it's big, it's unequally uh, distributed, uh, but it affects our entire democracy. So uh, we made, bless you, we made some uh, 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 important findings there in the consequences uh, chapters. So we were then asked as a National Academy panel to review what does this evidence say for policy? It's not what policies would we like. We are not individuals on this panel. We are a consensus panel. And it, everything flows from the evidence. So what, what, is the what are the implications for policy of this evidence? So uh, we came to the following conclusion. I sort of lost track of where we are on the slides. Not, not that one. There we go. Uh, sorry, Bettina. We'll, <laughs> we'll figure out the coordination here. Next time we do this. Uh, so the, the bottom line conclusion, bolded conclusion in the book, is policymakers at the state and the federal level should take necessary steps to significantly reduce the rates of incarceration in the United States. Policymakers, some of whom we have in this room, we're talking mostly about legislators. The, 
clear conclusion of our findings and our, therefore our recommendations is that this is a question for our elected officials. This is a matter of sentencing policy established by our government. It's not to say that alternatives to incarceration aren't important, not to say that uh, uh, changing police practices aren't important, not to say that uh, education programs aren't important, but in terms of reducing incarceration rates, this is a policy, and by that we mean a political question. So we also say, just to continue our conclusion, the policies leading to high incarceration rates are not serving the country well. That's the little sound bite that most press picked up on. Uh, and we are past the point where the numbers of people in prison can be justified by social benefits. Uh, so we call upon the country to embark in a national conversation. That's what we're doing here. And a number of us on the panel have very busy speaking schedules over the next year to carry this out. Um, to develop, to rethink the role of prison in our society. That's basically the challenge here. What is the role of this social institution uh, in our society? And we ask the question, can a criminal justice system be designed that makes less use of incarceration to better achieve uh, its aims than a harsher and more punitive system such as we have now? And we don't review the literature here, but we just point to uh, areas of, uh, of promise, practical steps that can be taken to move in this direction. So in coming to that final conclusion, we had this wonderful discussion, and you know, just, I have such admiration for my colleagues on the panel, where we said this is not a cost-benefit question. What should the country do going forward? This is not a run-the-numbers question. This is not a question of just uh, empirical analysis. This is ultimately a deep question about values. So we went midway, I, I've been authorized to say this because it was sort of outside of our purview. We went mid, midway in our work, we went to the, the, our sort of superiors at the National Academy and said, we want to make some normative statements. We want to review a literature on principles. Is that okay for the National Academy of Sciences to talk in this voice? And they said, absolutely. You are charged with reviewing whatever is the scholarly literature that's relevant. And if there's a philosophical literature that's relevant here that goes back to Kant, even though it's not you know, something that is, is seen as being uh, necessarily scientific, you should review that literature. So we did. So chapter 12, which I commend to everybody who wants to read anything in the book, read chapter 12, reviews four principles that we think are relevant to the discussion going forward and that we note were not given sufficient attention over the last four decades. There we are. So the guiding principles uh, that I just call your attention to and are worthy of discussion uh, and worthy of, uh, I think, deep thought here. Uh, the first is the principle of proportionality. So this principle holds that, and you know, as uh, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan would say, the punishment should fit the crime, right? So that it's a common sense notion, but we have abandoned this in many ways, certainly in drug policy. We've abandoned this. Three strikes abandons this. So the notion that the punishment should fit the crime, the, the notion that legal principle of proportionality in every law school textbook is something that we've lost sight of. So that is a, a limit on the power to punish, a limit established by the principle of proportionality. So we and legislatures and legislators and judges and others and sentencing commission should pay attention to that principle. Second principle, slightly different but very powerful, is the principle of parsimony. This principle, which uh, if we resurrect this, uh, I will be so happy because I think it's a very important principle. Uh, again, it goes back to uh, philosophers of, of uh, long standing. Uh, is the principle that the state is not entitled in our name to inflict pain on another citizen beyond that required to reasonably achieve a social purpose. I'll say it one more time. It's got a lot of stuff in it. The state is not entitled in our name to inflict pain, punishment, or anything on another individual and a fellow citizen to, beyond that necessary, to achieve, reasonably necessary, to achieve a legitimate social purpose. So this basically says we can't just ramp up because we want to. There's, there should be some limits on the power of the state. This is actually a libertarian principle. Uh, this is where I find common purpose with some interesting folks. 
Uh, and uh, it is, we've lost sight of this principle when we think about criminal justice policy. We should ask, are we, is this the right thing to do to go to this level of punishment or to impose fines or probation or whatever? Uh, the third principle, if I'm in the right order, uh, this is the, we call it the principle of citizenship. Human dignity has different names in our, in our deliberations. It is the conditions and consequences of imprisonment should not be so severe or long-lasting as to violate one's fundamental status in society. So this is another principle honored in another literature, uh, sort of the human rights literature, the uh, sort of social uh, uh, cohesion literature, uh, that, okay, we understand that we have to, uh, in some cases, punish somebody for their wrongdoing, but that punishment has to recognize that uh, they all come back, a good book title, uh, has to recognize that, uh, that people, we, we are trying to reestablish a, a standard of, of, of a standing for everybody. So that's an important principle. It applies with, applies with particular power uh, to prisons, right? So we shouldn't so damage somebody's status and standing when they come out, they can't be uh, reintegrated. Then the fourth principle is a principle of social policy, of social justice. And I think one of the contributions of our panel that will have uh, legs is that we have focused on the institution of the prison. Oft forgotten, put outside of our thinking, we focus a lot of research, attention on the research that's been done within prison. We note how little we know about life within prison from a research point of view. We call upon the federal government and foundations to fund research that gets inside those institutions. But this principle is a principle of social policy, social justice, which basically says that a prison should, be, should promote the general well-being, should, and, and we call them at some points in the, in the report, the pillars of justice. And someone once said to me, what do you mean the pillar of justice? I said, exactly what it sounds like. These should be to promote the well-being of our society. Uh, they should be open to public scrutiny. They should be uh, accountable in courts and legislatures. Uh, they should be held account for, for outcomes. Uh, and they should be seen as places that promote uh, our notions of justice. So these principles guided us when we came to our final conclusions. And we hope that they would guide you as well. So the obvious bottom line conclusion is reduce uh, incarceration and the harmful effects of incarceration significantly. Um, and as the nation is doing that, to uh, pay attention to these principles and open up prisons for public uh, scrutiny, uh, reduce the use of prison overall, uh, and develop a more effective, more humane, uh, less burdensome uh, responses uh, to crime. So I'm going to end with some observations that we make uh, in our report. Again, this is not my voice. Uh, this is, I'm speaking on behalf of the committee. So we recommend significant reductions in incarceration rates. There's no number here. But you can get a sense that we imagine a big change when you look at the historical and the international uh, points of reference that we took. We note in the report that a number of states, including this state, have witnessed some reductions in their rates of incarceration, and we say, bravo. But we don't get excited about them because they're modest. Even this, this state has only modest changes in the rates of incarceration. So we don't quantify it, but we are pretty clear that we have some big uh, notions in mind, and we know that it's going to take a long time. We also note with interest uh, the uh, emergence of a new attitude within the country towards criminal justice generally, and particularly to mass incarceration. We never use the word mass incarceration, but you know what I mean. Uh, and to thinking about this quite differently. And we call attention in particular to those three areas where we say the, in, the growth can most, we contribute the growth to, long sentence is longer. So what does that mean for a legislature and for people in this room to think about? It means rolling back long sentences. That's tough stuff for any elected official to do, to say, I'm going to reduce the sentence for crime X that was imposed by my colleagues 20 years ago. But that's what we have in mind. And some states are doing that on truth, truth and sentencing, but actually there's not a lot of change there. This, the second contributor that we pay attention to in the report is mandatory minimums. There, there's some movement in a number of states, can be a lot more movement, uh, can be wholesale movement to develop more effective alternatives. We also, in our report, call attention in many ways throughout the report to uh, the war on drugs 
And this is an area where the increase in, in incarceration rates has been greater than anything else's, tenfold over those 40 years, and where the research literature shows that the results of that have, you can't find positive results of that in terms of the price of drugs or the uh, use of drugs. I'm not to say that, I'm not here saying that there should be no drug laws, but we have to think about the level of punishment for those violations. And that is also starting to change. So we note with interest this change, but I think the clear implication of the panel is that significant means a lot more than what is happening here. So we call to your attention those guiding principles as a starting point for the discussion and as guideposts for as we move forward. We call particular attention to long sentences, mandatory minimums, and drug policy. We are not going to get our way out of this, out of mass incarceration by bringing crime rates down anymore. <laughs> Guess what? They're very low. And, you know, and, and we also found that that's not what's keeping incarceration rates up. We're not going to get incarceration rates down by developing much more robust, many more robust alternatives. It doesn't help because the policy change has not been the precursor to that. So the hard political work is the work that we hope is, starts here today in our state, which is to imagine a very different regime where uh, sentencing policy, the use of prison, is radically different from what we've seen over the past uh, 40 years. So that's our report. It's also 450 pages. If you want to read it in greater detail uh, outside, buy it or, or download it. Uh, but we thank you for the interest. So now I'm going to call uh, Nick Turner to be our moderator, call my fellow panelists, uh, to, the, to the stage, and I think I'm going to just sit down. So thanks a lot.